it's a little bit of a hodgepodge of topics to do with eyes and ophthalmology. And um, I kind of, believe it or not, there's all sorts of specialties in ophthalmology and I kind of stay at the front of the eye and a lot of my colleagues do other work at the back of the eye so we kind of separate it. So I'll be predominantly talking about things to do with the front of the eye today. So, I mean, you don't have to know the names of all of these things, but, you know, the bits that I'll be talking about the, today is the cornea, which, if you like, is the clear window on the front of your eye, which covers your, well, if you have a blue eye or a brown eye, your iris. And then this is your iris here. And then you have a gap in the middle, which is the pupil. And behind that, you have your lens. So it's amazing. Probably the commonest operation that we do now in ophthalmology is the cataract operation. And it's amazing, I would say still 50% of people who come into us today still think a cataract is like a film or a scum or something that's growing on the surface of your eye and we scrape it off and then you can see much better. But in fact, it's nothing like that. What it is, is it's the lens. So we all have a natural lens. And when you're born, it's crystal clear. As you get older, the first thing that happens with it is the center of the lens gets a little bit harder. So it doesn't have the same flexibility and softness, which means its ability to focus begins to weaken. And that's why we begin to lose our reading vision in our mid to late 40s, early 50s, and we find it stretching out because the lens can't change shape. And then as that goes on, gradually, gradually, as we get older, the lens begins to cloud. And when the cloudiness gets to the level that it interferes with your vision, then it's called a cataract. So all it is is the natural lens, as you're getting older, is getting cloudier and it's interfering with your vision. Okay. Now, the back of the eye, um, if you like, is, 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 it, this shows it is sort of hollowed out. And we have the retina. And the retina is very important, obviously, with respect to seeing. So in this little model here, the person has put their hand in, if you can imagine, and elevated what looks like the retina. And that's what the retina would look like. So it's a very, very thin, translucent kind of a structure, very, very thin, that has the blood vessels running through it. But of course, it contains the very, very important cells, the rods and cones that allow us to see. And if we go back to the previous slide, it's this area here in the center of your retina, sort of behind your lens directly. That's where the light will be most precisely focused. That's our kind of line of target. That's where we see best. So that's our highest level of acuity. And unfortunately, that's the area that as we often get older, begins to degenerate and is a cause of significant visual loss in macular degeneration. So when you hear macular degeneration, that's where it's affecting. It's affecting the central part in that localized area here. So you could have all sorts of problems and scars which are written up here, down here, and it have little or no impact in your vision at all. You'd be unaware of it. But if you have a scar here or something going on or leakage of fluid, you'll be very, very aware that your central vision is affected. Now, the eye also sits in a kind of a, a bony socket. So the eye is like an eyeball, but it has muscles which move it. So we have a muscle up on the top, right, left, one at the bottom, and we have little ones around the back that sort of do little twisting movements of the eye. And in between, the muscles all go back, all go back this way here. And this little thing here in the middle between them is the optic nerve. So if you can imagine, the cells in your retina are very specific neuronal cells. They all have little very thin fibers that all come together. They're carrying the messages. And basically, they leave the eye here, the sclera, there's a hole in the back of your eye, and they all converge together, and they form the optic nerve, and they leave, and that's what goes back to your brain. So they're the important kind of constituents, if you like, of your, of your eye. And today I'm going to sort of co concentrate mainly on the cornea here, as I said, and the lens behind it. Okay? So when we measure people's vision, we, you know, we put them in a room and the lights are usually down a certain amount down low, and we get them to use, or we get them to read a visual acuity chart. Now, in the old days, you had to be a fixed distance away from the chart, and of course, it's six meters, which is six six vision or the Americans are still talking in terms of feet. So for them, it's 20-20. So 20 
20 meters is, or 20 feet is six meters. But of course you can play tricks with it. You can have a mirror, which means you don't need to have a room that's six meters long and you can split the distance. And we have projection charts now that will show this, you know, the proper size letter for a particular distance. So we measure the vision in each eye. And that's just a measure of the person's visual acuity. Now it's a very important measure because it's the most important part of our vision, but it's not the only part. And it's a little bit of a crude measure as we'll see later on when people have symptoms with cataracts and so on. But it is what we use, the mainstay, if you like, of our measurement of, of vision. We also sometimes look at patients' color vision. Some color vision defects are inherited and they're relatively common, um, particularly in young men. Sometimes they're aware of them, sometimes they're not aware of them. Um, this is a control slide. Everybody sees the 12. Most of us will see the 74, but some will see it as a 71 if they have red, um, um, green blindness. So again, we have um, um, little charts that we can use to pick up color vision um, deficits. And you know, they're, they're not majorly important. It's just that at a young age, it's nice for people to be aware of it because in certain professions it can be a little bit problematic but nowadays it's much much less so of an issue it'd be very hard to discriminate against somebody now in a profession on the basis of um, color vision deficit when we look into the back of the eye so we put on we hold up an ophthalmoscope to our eye or we put one on our head and we look in we're kind of looking at the center of the eye this is the macula area here again the important area and we want to see that nice and clean and dry and no fluid and I'll show you slides later where there are problems with it. These are all the normal blood vessels, the arteries and the veins. They come in and leave through the center of the optic nerve and that's if you like you're looking face on to the optic nerve as it's leaving. So you can imagine there's these very 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 thin fibers all the way here coming together and they're all coming together and leaving through this hole here at the back and that's what we see the optic nerve leaving the back of the eye. So you can see that that's a normal optic nerve and you can see the edge of it nicely demarcated. Whereas these two here, right eye, left eye, you can see there's little hemorrhages on it and you get the impression, although you're only looking at that in a sort of monocular, so you don't get the impression of, of stereopsis, but you can see and get the impression that that nerve looks swollen. That is kind of protruding. So um, that would be papilledema, so there would be a problem perhaps raised intracranial pressure and that would be significant very very high blood pressure so if we see something like that we know there's something significant amiss um, with the patient so again this one here is a healthy optic nerve and you can see it's got a nice pink color it always has a small little depression in the center which we call the cup but over here you can see it's much whiter and this little small little cup here the depression is much much bigger and that's in glaucoma because basically in glaucoma it's a condition where the pressure is too high and all those little thin nerve fibers that we were talking about a while ago they're sensitive to high pressure and if you've high pressure in your eye and it's left uncontrolled those thin little nerve fibers begin to degenerate and they, as they degenerate then if you like it you know this nerve is losing little nerve fibers bit by bit by bit so that's what it looks like. It's almost like a hollowed out nerve. And that's a very characteristic finding we see in people who would have um, advanced glaucoma. Now, sometimes people say, you know, diabetes, people know that diabetes can affect the eye and it can affect it in many ways. And to some extent, the longer your diabetes, the more likely you'll have some problems. So if somebody's just a diabetic within a year or two, particularly if it's not totally out of control they most likely have no problems with their eyes for a good number of years it's also proportional to how poorly you're controlled so you know some younger diabetics you know who can be problematic in terms of taking their insulin and so on now the percentage of that is getting less and less can have horrendous problems so they can have little hemorrhages like this what happens with the diabetes is the blood vessels get a bit leaky so they leak this serum fluid all the time and the retina is doing its best to get rid of all this fluid and it can get rid of the liquid part of the fluid but the fatty or the lipid component it doesn't deal with as well and you get these lipid exudates you get edema and you can see some of this is all happening around the macula so that patient's vision would be very very poor because they would have a lot of edema around the macula area here whereas if you have this exudate here 
and they're up around here, the patient will probably be asymptomatic. So that's why we do the screening now in diabetes. So there's a screening program that's been rolled out nationally to detect these things because a lot of it is treatable. Similarly, sometimes people can get a blockage in a vein, and you can see this here. And the reason that that's important, well, obviously it's important to that particular patient in that particular eye because it will affect their vision. But it's also important because it may be a sign of other problems. So they may have, it may be a sign that they have significant atherosclerosis elsewhere and they need to have their heart checked out, they need to have their carotid arteries in their neck checked out, and they need to have a full medical, if you like, to make sure that there are no other underlying issues. And then sometimes in the younger kids, um, you see, we see what we call as a squint. Now, there was a vogue many, many years ago. We probably didn't understand as well as we do now the etiology of squints 30 and 40 years ago. And a lot of kids had squints then, and they had lots of operations as small kids and so on. Some worked out well, some didn't, and, and so forth. But now we know the most common cause of that type of a squint, where one eye is looking straight forward and the other is kind of turning into the nose, is that the child is very, very long-sighted. And when you're very long-sighted, there's a drive as you're focusing, because you have to focus very hard to keep things clear. When you're focusing hard, there's a drive for the eye to turn in. And sometimes that drive is so strong, it breaks down the fusion, which is this ability to use the eyes together and the child develops a squint. So the treatment for that is not at that age to do surgery just to move the muscles around and pull the eye out. The treatment is to give the child the appropriate glasses. So that's why now we see, you see kids at two years of age, they can hardly walk and they have the glasses strapped to their head and so on. And that's the correct treatment now. Because in, the major, and in a lot of cases, as we get older, that amount of long-sightedness gradually goes down. And maybe 50% of these kids over the period of maybe up to 10 years of age or so may get out of their glasses as their long-sightedness fades as they grow. And maybe 50% will still need their glasses, but a lower prescription to keep them straight. And it's only those where the glasses don't keep them straight that we do surgery and they do much, much better. Now, the important thing about the squint in young kids is that if you um, induce a squint overnight in somebody as a child or whatever, um, immediately you'll get double vision. And that's a very um, disconcerting symptom. So in young children, the brain doesn't like that. So to see double is a horrible thing. So what the brain does is it decides fairly quickly, I can see with this eye, this eye is looking over here, it's causing double vision. It begins to learn to suppress the image coming in from the squinting eye. And it can do that in a young child very, very well, too well. And what happens now is even though that eye is totally anatomically normal, it's just pointing the wrong way, it's not getting the visual stimuli, if you like, transmitted all the way back to the brain. So those important cells in the occipital cortex that look after your vision, they don't get stimulated at a young age and they don't develop well. And if they don't get stimulated up to the age of five, six, or seven, no matter what you do in later life, you're not going to get them back. So that's the etiology or the background to this lazy eye. So people will say, oh, I know somebody who's a lazy eye. So this is one of the commonest reasons that they have a squint. The brain decides, I'm going to suppress the image coming in from that. And if that's not corrected, so what we do is we look after the squint, we put them in the glasses, and what we sometimes have to do is we patch the good eye for a number of hours a day to make this eye look straight and get the visual stimuli and get the, if you like, the cortical cells stimulated. I say if you miss the boat and the patient presents at a later stage, you're not going to get that vision back in later life. So again, you'll see the small kids wearing the glasses now at one and two and three years of age, and they're wearing the patch, the occlusion treatment, to stimulate the good eye and uh, to give them good vision. And believe it or not, if you overdo it, if you patched this eye for too long, supposing you said we'll do 24 hour patching for a week just to give this a kick start, you can ju induce a little bit of laziness in this eye. So you have to mix and match. So you can't occlude the eye completely all the time. So we have to give it a break to make sure we don't do the same with that one. So back to cataracts. So as I was saying a while ago, the cataracts 
are very common and it's probably uh, the commonest operation we do, I'm sure it is. And so when we examine the carat, we put in a drop, a dilating drop. So you can see there that that pupil has been dilated. So there's a big, 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 big pupil. And that allows us to look at the lens, because if you remember, the lens is sitting just right in behind the pupil and allows us to see it much, much better. So normally, when you're looking at the lens, when the light's kind of coming from the side, it's like your own pupil. It should be nice and black and even, and you should see no cloudiness or no opacities in it. But you can see here these little bicycle spoke kind of opacities, and we call those cortical opacities. And that's a common type of cataract, and it can cause certain types of symptoms, and it would be the earlier forms. Now, sometimes you may see that in a patient who's totally asymptomatic, no symptoms whatsoever. So usually we say, look, you have a little bit of aging in the lens, not causing any symptoms, go away and stay in touch with your optician or whatever, and if you have symptoms, they'll send you back, and then we can talk about what needs to be done. Or they may have significant symptoms, and if they do, then we discuss the symptoms that they might have. So one of the symptoms that early cataract can cause, even sometimes before, so you might measure their vision on the chart we showed you, and their vision might be pretty good. But they might say, yeah, I'm not too bad, you know, during the day, but at night I'm not happy with my night driving. And, you know, and sometimes they don't, maybe, they're not able to explain it all that well. So these are just slides to kind of show you some of the symptoms that some of these patients can have. So you might class that as like normal night vision. And then that one there, so you can imagine that would be very distressing at nighttime. So there's a lot of glare. So you can have opacities in the lens that at nighttime your pupil is a lot more dilated and the light is getting, you know, if you like, dispersed as it's going through. It's not being focused in a nice, even way, and they can have a lot of symptoms. So that person might say, during the daytime, I'm fine, but nighttime, I'm really worried on the roads. Similarly, back to kind of normal night vision again, and now sometimes pe people will describe to us that they see halos. So what they see is the lights look like there's a light and there's a fuzz, a big fuzz of light coming around it. So these are symptoms that sometimes people will complain of with early cataract, but yet their vision may be fairly fairly good. So depending on what they do and how bad the symptoms are, then we have a discussion whether it's time to remove the cataract or not. Now you'd certainly be talking about removing that cataract. So again, the pupil has been dilated, that's the edge of the pupil. So that person's kind of got a blue iris. And you can see now, we should normally see there a nice black pupil. But what that is, is the lens and you can see it's kind of got a golden yellow color in the center of it's white. Their vision, they're not going to see the first letter on the chart. Their vision is really, really poor. So that's quite an advanced sort of a cataract there. I think there's another one there. So there's one, I mean, this is unusual. I think this was a trauma case. So here, dilated pupil, and again, the lens is in there, and when the light just shines directly, you have a nice black pupil. But over here, you can see, you can diagnose that from the back of a book. So there's a white opacity in the pupil. So that's the cataract. And again, that patient has very, very, very poor vision. They'd be hard pressed to come fingers six inches in front of their, their eye. Okay. So there used to be this thing, and you know, still people and patients say to us, you know, you mentioned to them that they have a cataract or they're complaining of symptoms and they have a cataract, and they say, Well, is my cataract ripe? Is it ready? So that's what a ripe cataract was. And you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, that's what we did. We waited until the cataract was very, very poor because the surgery wasn't as refined and as good outcomes as it is now. So it, to some extent, you waited until it was so bad you, you really didn't have much to lose. <coughs> but we don't do that anymore. So now, what you do is you remove the cataract when you diagnose it, when it's interfering with the patient's activities of daily living, whatever they are, to the point that it's a problem for them. And that can be totally different for different patients. So you could have an architect who has the earlier cataracts that I showed you back here, this one here, with not an awful lot of cataract there, but it might be very problematic for him in the fine drawings and fine work he does, and it might make his job extremely difficult. You could have a farmer who has that, does very little in the way of computer work, book work, and so on, totally happy with his vision. But the one where you do find a lot of this comes down to in terms of whether they need surgery or not is you have to ask them, are they a driver? Because if they're driving, there's a set standard <coughs> that you need. You need 6, 12 at least in your worst eye. So if they're falling below that, you need to say to them, well, 
if you're going to leave this, you know, you shouldn't be driving. Or if you're on the borderline, say, look, your borderline, if your license is coming up, you're going to have to think about having it done very soon. Okay. So then in terms of doing the cataract surgery, this is a video here. I think it's about three minutes or so. So it'll come back into the center. So, the, so we've dilated the pupil, all right? So the patient is lying down. They've dropped in that has numbed their eye, but they're conscious. Sometimes we give them a bit of sedation, but they're conscious because you want them to be conscious. Now, you can do it under general anesthetic if the patient is very young or there's a problem there, but mostly we do it. So what we're doing is the lens is wrapped in a bag to all intents and purposes. It's like very fine clink film. So what we're doing is we're catching the little bag here in the front of the lens and we're tearing it around in a circle. So what that's doing is it's opening the bag, if you like, so that we can get at, get at the lens in the middle. Okay. Now what we did there was we just put in a little bit of fluid and we mixed it and we can move the lens. Now that little probe that's going into eye, that's a very high frequency ultrasound. And what it does is it kind of softens and sucks out the lens at the same time. So we're making a little groove, as you can see in the center. And then in a while, we'll move that sideways. We'll put another groove 180 degrees to it. So if you like, we have two kind of crisscrossing grooves. We'll break it up into small little fragments. And then we'll try and take it out. So the whole principle is take out the cloudy lens within the bag that it's in. We want to leave that bag. And the reason we want to leave that bag is because that's anatomically where your lens should be. And when we're finished, we want to put in a new lens and we want the new lens to go back into that bag. The old operation was we took out the lens, the bag, everything. But then we weren't putting in intraocular lenses into the eye. And in those, those days, people used to wear those really, really thick um, glasses that were almost bottle end glasses. But now we put the lens back into the eye. And so we want to make sure that the bag stays intact because uh, that's the best place to keep the lens secure and it works best there. So what we're doing now is we've kind of broken the lens into those four little, I suppose, like little pizza slices and we take them out one at a time. So you can see, depending on the lens, it's got a certain amount. That's kind of moderate consistency. Sometimes it can be extremely hard and sometimes it's almost like jelly. It sucks out in no time. The younger you are, the softer it is. Okay, so we clean out all the little last bits of everything so that when we're finished then we have a nice empty bag with a little circular opening in the front of it and what we'll do then when we're finished is we're putting in this little clear jelly into the bag to sort of fill it up okay like a bowl you know get it nice and big push down the back surface of the bag and then these lenses that come nowadays they're made of a very soft material so the lens is coiled up inside of the little injector, so you'll see it going in. So when we inject it in, then it opens up, it unfolds, and it goes in under the, into the bag where the original lens was. So we just sort of position that back in there, and then we put in a bit of antibiotic and so on, and then we're done. So that's how you remove it. So you want to take out the cloudy lens. Now if you take out the cloudy lens, and you don't put the artificial lens back in, well, You've taken away the obstruction, if you like, to light, but there's nothing to focus the light. So the patient's vision is very, very poor. So that's why we put the lens back in. And there's a million and one different types of lenses. Most of the lenses we put in, we try and figure it so that we leave the pe person with good distance vision, and then they need reading glasses. But there are newer lenses that sometimes are good, sometimes they're not so good, they can have problems, not so problems, you know, where it's a bit like your spectacles. So you can have a very focal in your spectacle where a little bit does the distance, a little bit does the middle, and a little bit does the reading. And they're coming up with these designs with lenses called multifocal lenses to see can we put it in so that you'd have good distance near an intermediate vision without wearing glasses. But they are not a panacea for everybody. They can cause problems too. Sometimes the back surface, we've left the little back surface of the bag there, and sometimes that clouds over. So here, you can see all that cloudiness there. They're just epithelial cells. They're lens epithelial cells growing on the back surface of the bag. You can see the edge of the lens. There's the little hooks that keep it in place. And we use the laser just to make a little opening in the center of the back surface 
so the light will go through that and it will give them nice clear vision. And that's a very common thing that happens one to three or four years after the surgery. It's only a two minute thing that you do in the office. The one thing you don't want to get after a cataract infection, or sorry, after a cataract operation is infection because your eye is almost like an incubator. So if bugs get inside in your eye, it's not good news because they multiply rapidly and they cause a lot of disruption. Now, fortunately, it's extremely rare. It's about one in 2,000, one in 3,000. And we now know, because you know, we've done these studies, that if you put at the end of the operation, the last thing we do is we just inject a little bit of antibiotic where we put in the lens, we know that that reduces it again. So, and that's what we do. We put that in every patient. Every patient also is on an antibiotic drop the week afterwards. So the incidence is getting lower and lower. But it's the one thing we tell every patient it can happen, but it's extremely um, uncommon. Okay. So the other thing that kind of fascinates, I suppose, the public then is, so that's all to do with cataract, and the cataract is the lens which is sitting behind your pupil. So then people often say to us, you know, the other thing that fascinates people is laser eye surgery. Okay. So laser eye surgery is, it's a very simple principle. And what it is, is you're applying a laser to reshape the surface of your cornea. Okay. So when you wear glasses when you're short sighted, and if the glasses have a certain shape, and if you like, they're diverting the light in a different way. They're focusing the light to overcome whether you're long sighted or short sighted or astigmatism. It's the same with contact lenses. They do the same. And it's the same with the laser. So what we're doing is we're putting a change on the shape of your cornea, if you like, to permanently incorporate your prescription so that the light is now focused more clearly on the lens. Now, there's no point in doing that, if you can imagine, because the word I used there a while ago was permanently. So there's no point in me permanently changing somebody's cornea who's short-sighted, who's 14 or 15 or 16, because as they're getting older, their prescription is changing all the time. So you have to get to a period. Now, there's no magic age. You can't say a 22-year prescription will never change. It doesn't work like that. But we wait until such time as they're a minimum into their 20s, and we have a sense that their prescription has been has been stable. So you can use it for short-sighted people, long-sighted people, astigmatism, combinations of those. And there's some efforts now, and some of the things are encouraging, some not so encouraging. And that's the one that's the more difficult one to treat, believe it or not, is people just wearing plain ordinary reading glasses. So what we do is, so again, all these operations, you're lying there in your senses. But it's amazing what people will actually let you do when you put everybody's going, oh, not me. <laughs> but you do. I mean, if you had said to me 20 years ago when I started, when we started, when I started training 20, 25 years ago, what a local anesthetic in Canada, and we hated giving local anesthetics. We much preferred to put people to sleep. But when the patient said, no, 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 I don't want to general anesthetic now, it involved an injection with a needle right down under your eye. We let it work for about 15 minutes to make sure the whole eye was, n you know, numb. We also gave an injection here in front of the ear to numb or to paralyze the muscles so that you couldn't squeeze the eye through the Now the operation was a bigger operation. Like that operation I showed you in the cataract, that opening that that probe is going in and out is 2.5 millimeters, so it's very small. Whereas when we were doing the old cataract operation, we used to open the eye from about 10 o'clock all the way over to 2 o'clock, and we'd have to put in five or six stitches. So we had to give them lots of anesthetic. But now, in the majority of these cases, we put in drops and ointments that numb the eye, maybe give them a little bit of sedation. Nine times out of 10, most people will say, maybe I felt a bit of pressure or I didn't feel anything. So it does, believe it or not, it, it does work well. So in terms of then the laser, so what we do here, so I'm showing you an example of a laser for somebody who's short-sighted. So what we're doing is we want to do two things. We want to use one laser that's going to make a thin little flap in your cornea. That's the laser coming in, okay? So we've got that little thing down here, which is kind of sucked onto your eye. The laser then just sits in the center of it, and now the laser is firing. And what this particular laser does is it delivers a tiny, tiny little bit of energy in tiny little micron spots, loads of little spots. And each little energy causes, causes a cavitation bubble. So if you have hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of these little bubbles all like that, and you <coughs> wait, the bubbles all kind of join up, and you get a nice cleavage plane without having to cut with a knife or a blade. So 
So we lift the laser out and put in more drops. So that's the person lying there. That little speculum keeps their eye open. So we just put on a few marks because we're going to lift the flap now in a minute. And when we lay the flap back down, we want to make sure the marks all align and the flap is in the nice, nice position. So the laser is just being focused on it. Now it's looking at the pupil. And there's a picture of that patient's iris in the laser already. So it recognizes that that's the particular patient and it locks on to its iris. So there's the flap. So you see we can go in. So that little space has been made by the laser. Previously we used to use a blade to make that little cut in the cornea, but now the laser does it much more efficiently and more importantly, more safely. So all of that is on the surface of your cornea. So if you imagine your cornea is 500 microns, that's like a fifth of it. It's like 100 microns thick, that little flap. So now we're down in the next layer and that's gonna take 22 seconds. So the laser's firing away, the patient sits there, they look up at the light, they don't feel anything. The laser's just going click, 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 click. And then it goes, you know, it goes pretty quick. So that person's almost a minus four. So they're moderately, like they have a good prescription, they're moderately short-sighted. There's the flap, so it's on a hinge. So the flap is kind of laying back like this. When it's finished, we put in some drops, antibiotic drops and so on. And then what we do is we gently put the flap back in place. We'll rinse underneath it. And then also we'll, um, We'll um, see the way now that it's important to align the little marks so that we know there's no little wrinkles in the flap and that it's nice and straight. So that's it. So that's what we do. So the whole purpose of that was to change the shape of the cornea. So that person was short-sighted. So essentially what the laser was doing, it was removing tissue off the center of that person's cornea. So it's making, instead of the cornea being curved like that, comes up and it's just that little bit flatter in the center and then it comes down. So in somebody who's short-sighted, you want to flatten the center. Somebody who's long-sighted, what you want to do is you remove tissue like a donut in the periphery so the center of it looks a little bit steeper. So you're using the laser to reshape the cornea so that you're focusing the light in a different and in a sort of a better way. So other sort of more um, not common procedures we do in the eye then would be to do with problems with the cornea where um, persons have gotten infections and they have medical problems where that have left them with a scar on their cornea. So one that we would see not infrequently, believe it or not, is people who get, now I mean people where loads and loads of people wear contact lenses, never any problem, and sometimes people get minor infections. But sometimes, unfortunately, you can be a bit unlucky and get nasty infections. And that's a nasty infection caused by a bug called Pseudomonas. And you can see that's an infection in the cornea. So the bug is in the cornea. It's caused a big opacity there. They are inflammatory kind of pus cells within the eye. Now, we'll be able to treat that medically, but that person's going to be left with a nasty scar. And unfortunately for them, it's right smack in the middle of the center of their cornea and their pupil. Now, we wouldn't do a cornea transplant at that stage because the eye is hot and inflamed and there's infection. So we treat it. It'll take a few months for that to settle down. And then we wait a few more months, and when the eye is nice and quiet, then we would do a corneal transplant. Now, that picture there was given to me by somebody I worked with, and that was done in, I think, 1949. So that's a pretty primitive corneal transplant. And what they did was they cut out a whole, you know, quite a wide area of the cornea. They got a cornea from somebody who had died. They had no microscope, and they didn't have good sutures. So those sutures are pretty thick compared to what we use now. And what they did was basically they kind of put what we call a mattress suture. So that stitch is embedded there, it goes over there, it's embedded, crisscross, just if you like, to hold it in place. And then the person rested in bed probably for about two months with a pad on. Then you took off the pad, probably 80 or 90% of the time, which was a disaster. But once in a while you got lucky and the thing healed and you got a good result. So, so then they moved on and they realized you could put in the stitches individually that would be a horrendously uncomfortable eye. Mm -hmm. There are stitches there now with little knots on them on the surface of your eye. So not many of them worked, okay? Mm -hmm. But now we have a microscope which made a huge difference. And the other thing that makes a big difference is the stitches are much, much finer. So there's somebody with an, an infection with a big scar. Now there are the individual little stitches and they're finer than the hair on your head. So they're 10 old, so they're very, very, very fine 
And sometimes we put them in in single stitches, or sometimes we put them in, so there's the graft, there's the border of the graft, and there's a little running stitch holding it in place. So it's come a long way in terms of the microscope, the instruments, the sutures mean, you know, the outlook and the prognosis for people who need coronary transplants now is, is much, much better. And they generally do well. Um, and the, the eye, as in specifically the cornea, is what we call relatively immune privileged in that the big thing is the normal cornea doesn't have any blood vessels. So if it doesn't have any blood vessels, it's difficult for the cornea to recognize that there's something foreign being put into it. And that helps us a lot in terms of rejection. So most of these patients don't need any rejection medication. All we do is we give them drops. And fairly quickly, we get them down to maybe one drop a day. But sometimes they have problems. And so there's a graph there. And you can see the upper half is nice and clear. But this is all hazy. And this person is having a rejection. So what's happening is the body has recognized that this is foreign material. And it's mounted an inflammation against it. And the inflammatory attack is on the inside of that graft, on the cells on the inside. And if they don't work, then the graft gets swollen and hazy. Sometimes we can reverse it. And if it's not too big a rejection, the rest of the cells will take over and clear the graft. And sometimes it doesn't. And that, you know, this particular person had a graft done. And then they, I can't remember where they were. They were from outside Ireland. They went away for five, six years. And then they ended up coming back again. And they came in. And that's what it looks like chronically a chronic rejected graft five years later. So you can see now, absolutely, totally hazy. And the other thing that has happened is all these blood vessels have grown in, which makes it much more difficult second time around to repeat it, because now the incidence of rejection is much higher, because now the cornea has blood vessels in it. Similarly, you can see that's a blown up picture of a graft. There's some of the stitches. Sometimes you'll see in one area, now there was a stitch in here that was loose, when you have a loose stitch, it just provokes a bit of inflammation. What you find is the blood vessels just in they come, quick as that. So you must remove the stitch and put them on steroid drops to try and get rid of it, or that will go on to cause a rejection. So, excuse me, the previous slide was where we replaced the whole thickness of the cornea. And that's for people who have a dense scar and a very opacified cornea. But some people, Actually, 90% of their <coughs> cornea is fine. It's just the inner layer that's the problem. And the inner layer of the cornea it has uh, a layer of cells on it called the endothelium. And their only job is to pump the fluid out of your cornea and keep it nice and clear. And if those cells don't work well, too much fluid gets into your cornea. It swells a bit like a sponge, and it gets cloudy. Now, we used to, for those people, the full corneal transplant, but now, in the last four or five years, we've refined it, and we can just replace the inner layer. And it's much better for the patient. It's much quicker. There's no stitches. So basically what we do is from the inside of the eye, we take out a circular, we scrape out a circular little eight, eight millimeter area, and we take out the membrane that those cells sit on. Then we get an eye from somebody who's died, and we get the inner layer, and we put it in, and we put an air bubble underneath it, and we float it up, and believe it or not, it actually sticks in there. So that's not, that little line that you see is not on the surface of the eye. That represents, if you like, an extra little layer that's on the inside. And then those healthy cells take over and pump the fluid out, and they clear your cornea and get you back to good vision. Now, very, very, very rarely, we show you the last little thing. Sometimes you have people who just are not going to do well with a corneal transplant. So a corneal transplant will only work if the eye is reasonably healthy. Like all the other bits of the eye, you have to have good tears, you have to be able to blink well, there can't be blood vessels. And this is somebody who has had an, a chemical burn for years. And you can see that, you know, that's like leather. The surface of the, the whole eye is, you know, very, very abnormal. If you put a corneal transplant in there, it will not heal and it will just, it just won't. So what we can do in those patients is we can put in an artificial window into a coronary transplant. So that's it. So that's what it looks like. So there's a little front plate, like a mushroom, and there's a back plate. And the front plate comes off the back plate. We get a coronary transplant, the 8 millimeter one like we showed you. We punch a little 3 millimeter hole in it. So we sandwich it in here. OK? 
Okay? So if you can imagine, I think the next slide must show it better. So this person has had a cornea transplant. That's the edge of their cornea out there. And I don't care what happens with that cornea. It's going to cloud over. But this is the front plate, and the back plate is in behind the cornea. And this is the plastic part here that stays clear. So this then allows them to see much better. Okay? So in people who may not be suitable for a cornea transplant and who have severe problems with their eyes, sometimes we can do things to bypass the cornea, if you like, and put in it. Um, um, that's made of similar material that we use to make the original intraocular lenses with. And in those small select group of patients, it can, it can be you know, the difference between seeing and not seeing. Because a lot of these people, they're down to one eye, and they really have little or no other alternative. So that's a bit of a mixed bag of things to do with the front of the eye. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah.